Good morning. Good to be back at my second home. I say that every place I go. Uh, no, not really. <clears throat> VFC has been a great part of my life. From the day I even came to intern here, I had to fight my way through from college in the States, and they wouldn't allow me to come to Asia to intern. I said, why would I want to intern in America when I'm going to be ministering in Asia? And I won the fight. <clears throat> so I think 1985 I came and interned. And, but before that, I was teasing Sister Diane today earlier. Um, I got to know Sister Diane when I was just seven years old. And uh, then when they first got married, Pastor Rick and Sister Diane came to our country and pastored our church for three months, which actually, that's the period I believe my life changed. <clears throat> and, you know, I just came back from East Timor. And uh, I was watching the, your service last week, a bit of it, and Pastor Jeremy shared too. And I was there for two weeks because I had to go to the village in the second week. And, um, you know, I was thinking when I was at the convention in Delhi, <clears throat> um, excuse me, I got to do what you did. <clears throat> um, in 2005, Pastor Rick took us to um, East Timor. And uh, sister churches, and we went, we drove, and it was the pu poorest and the newest nation in the world at that time. And, um, you know, to go back 20 years later, uh, tw they started in 2004, a year before we went, and um, to um, see what God has done. It's amazing. I want to thank uh, VFC. You know, sometimes you don't know what your missions is doing. You don't know what your dollars do. And sometimes maybe you're tired of giving, you're tired of praying and say, okay, everything is about this. I want to tell you, when you get to heaven, there are a lot of people who are going to come and say, thank you. Thank you, because you gave, you prayed, you sent. Our lives were changed. And um, Sister Sandy and all the other teams that have been there and um, even those on the ground now, you know, it's, it's amazing to see what God has done. To see Timorese rise up. And that was Pastor Rick's vision, you know. To get in there and change the nation. And, and I, I, I was blessed because I saw a lot of things I didn't see on my last trip five years before. <clears throat> and to see how God has raised uh, people from within the nation. And um, I thank God for that. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for being here. Lord, we felt your presence during worship. And as we entered this house. And now I pray that you would speak to our hearts from your word. Let Deshan decrease and the Holy Spirit increase. Lord, let your will be done. Change our lives according to your word. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. amen, amen. Today I want to talk to you about, I've entitled it, Remaining Firm in a Fickle World. Remaining Firm in a Fickle World. Because our world is fickle. Our world is changing. Uh, in Sri Lanka, we know what that change really means. We hit a... We hit all the crisis you could hit from COVID to, before that, to terrorism, and then coming into a financial crisis right now, which we are still going through. But one thing is for sure, it doesn't matter how fickle the world gets, God never changes. How many can say amen? God doesn't change. You know, so that's why I want to talk to you. Sometimes you have fear of change. And some changes are good, but then there are changes, uh, so many things happening that, that we don't care about. When you lose a loved one, when you lose a job, you know, I don't know what you're going through right now, but maybe there are some changes and we can resent them and run away from them if we could run, you know, and how do you deal with this? What are the changes that are causing anxiety in your life? Quickly, let's look at a few. One is everything in our life is speeding up. Have you noticed that? The pace of life is speeding up. Technology has done this to us. Because uh, technology has supposedly brought in progress and made things go faster. Progress is, is, is taking things to a fast rate. I think everything is progressing uh, faster except death. Technology has slowed death. I don't know what, what you understand what I'm saying. Today, you can, you're dying, but now because technology, you get on a machine and they'll slow 
your death. Okay, I thought I'll throw that in. Um, when the bullet trains that travel at what, 150, 175 miles an hour in Japan came about, people thought, oh great. Now we can go, it's going so fast, we can see the whole countryside and we can see more in a shorter time. And then they found out they were going so fast, everything was a blur. And, 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 and they couldn't focus on anything, right? And um, uh, it's, it's the same principle in life. Sometimes we are moving so fast. In Singapore, you move faster than anybody else I know, right? And sometimes you have to downshift, slow down. And focus on what you think that God wants. Otherwise, you get anxious. Anxiety sets in. The second thing is every decision is getting complicated. It's not simple like before. Even simple decisions are very complicated in our life. Why? Technology again has connected everything. You know, when the Asian stock market crashes, Wall Street in New York gets a hiccup. When there is a, a war in the Middle East, in minutes, the whole world knows about it now. Uh, you know, everything is so interconnected. And uh, we have, you know, other things, we have far too many choices. Now, in my country, not so many choices at the moment. But your country, you go to a market, how many types of shampoo do you guys have? <laughs> I mean, you have 50 types of shampoo, and still somebody says, oh, my one is not here. <laughs> well. So many choices, right? It's, a, it's another challenge. And the third thing is every value that we have is being challenged. Every value is being challenged. Right is being called wrong. Wrong is being called right. Some even say there is nothing called right or wrong. Whenever I hear anybody say, you know, there are no absolutes, I want to say, are you absolutely sure? Because that statement alone is an absolute. You see, how are we supposed to live when things are getting faster and they're speeding up and, and, and so much of compromise comes in and the frantic lifestyles, values of families are changed? Today we have gender issues and we have uh, sexual issues and things that we never faced before. So many things mixed up and complicated in this life that we're supposed to live. Well, in this changing world, I want in the next few minutes to leave three things with you. Three things that will never change in this ever-changing world. And you as a child of God, you have to hold on to what God says and not look at your environment, not look around and get so shaken and so scared and so worried and so anxious. I want to tell you, we are going through the worst crisis in our history in my nation. And I want to tell you, we have the biggest harvest of souls in our history. We've seen more souls come to Jesus. So, you know, it doesn't matter how it comes. We didn't ask for this. We actually don't want it. But if that's how it is, the eternal things God wants to do in your life are far more important than the little temporary things. So here are three things that will never change in this ever-changing world. Number one, God's love for you never changes. Turn to your neighbor and say, God's love for you will never change. God's love will never change. Malachi 3.6. Malachi 3.6. I am the Lord and I do not change. I am the Lord. I do not change. You know, why does God never change? You know why he doesn't change? Because God is perfect. And because God is perfect, he can't get any better. And he can't get any worse. Right? So God says, I never change. Listen to Jeremiah 31.3. Jeremiah 31.3. I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. With unfailing love, I've drawn you to myself. Now that's unchanging and that's everlasting. Yes. Friend, listen to me. I don't know what your struggle is, but God does. And I want you to know that you were created as an object of God's love. God loves you. He loves you the way you are. He loves you in spite of your failings. He loves you that you couldn't, even if you couldn't accomplish those things you thought, God loves you. And his, his love is, he, he, he created you. He created you. Yes, you. You. He created you to love you. 
You know, God never gets moody like us. God doesn't have a bad hair day. God never gets out, out, out on the wrong side of the bed. You know, the Bible says that God is always unchanging in his love towards us. This is such great news. You know, because while God is so consistent, you and I as humans are very inconsistent. Right? And the Bible teaches us that God loves me just as much on my good days as on my supposedly bad days. God loves me when I feel close to him or when I feel far away from him. His love doesn't change. My feelings change. He loves me. You see, God's love is not based on my or your performance. God's love for you is based on his character. Amen? So God loves you no matter what. Human love is quite fickle. We love and then we don't. We are hot and then we are cold, right? I run into people that say, you know, my husband is not the man I married. Well, neither are you. You know, my girlfriend likes me one day and she doesn't the next. Or my dad is inconsistent. You know, one day I'm a hero, next day I'm a zero. You know, because human love is fickle. You and I, because we are human, we know that. Right? And um, some days what happens is I'm grumpy. I don't know about you. Some days I'm grouchy. Some days I want to take out all my frustrations on the people that are closest to me. You know, this bothers me that sometimes I say the most hurtful things to the people I love the most. Why do I do that? Because I'm a human being. Because my life is inconsistent. But then, what did I say? But then, God. That's right. But then God is always consistent. He's not like us. Listen to Isaiah 44.10. Isaiah 44.10. For the mountains may move and the hues disappear, but even then my faithful love for you will remain. Amen. It never changes. You can count on Him no matter what happens in the future. God's love never changes. God is never going to stop loving you. Hello, listen to me. Whatever region you're listening in, God's love for you will never stop. You can't stop it. He loves you. That's who He is. Even you may not feel like it. There's one thing in this world that you can never do. You know what? You can never stop God from loving you. You believe that? I wanted to close your eyes. Do something I always do. Close your eyes wherever you are. Raise your hand or hands, whichever is easier. And say it with me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. A chorus I learned in Sunday school but never knew the meaning till I became an adult. How deep that is. Because God's love can never be stopped. Second thing, God's word never changes. Right? I want you to get a hold of this. Today we live in a compromising world. We live in a world that has so much of deception. And remember, deception is not for people in the world. Deception, the Bible talks it as one of the end time signs. Deception is for the church. You can't be deceived until you believe. You see, so deception is something that we are being hit with in these last days. And God's word never changes. I'm talking about the laws, the commands, the principles, the rules that God's word has about your life and mine. Listen to Isaiah 40 verse 8. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word, of the, the word of our God stands forever. Yes, it's timeless. It's enduring, it's eternal, it never withers. 
It's always fresh. It never gets stale. Amen? You know, God's word is never out of date. When human beings write things or get ideas, very soon they go out of date. For instance, when in the old days, now it's mostly electronic, but when they write a science textbook, they, they say when they write a science textbook, it takes about three to four years to print it and get it all out. By the time you go for print, the science textbook is out of date. You see, because human ideas get out of date. Well, my friend, listen to me carefully. I want to tell you there is one book. It was written over 1,600 years. It was written by 40 authors. It was written in three continents. It was written in three languages. And this book that was given to us, they wrote 40 authors over 1,600 years, three languages, three continents, but it ran one consistent theme. How did it all stick together? How was it all uniform? Because it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. How do you think they all got the same story? You know, it was even collected into one book called the Old Testament 1,000 years after all the authors had died. 1,000 years after they had all died. You know, if one person wrote a book, like most religious books, you can find uniformity. But how do you find uniformity in this? The Bible was written by poets and prophets, by princes and kings, by shepherds and by soldiers. The Bible was written by attorneys and a medical doctor. It was written by prisoners and fishermen. All kinds of people wrote the Bible. And then it was written in all kinds of locations, right? It was written in a cave. It was written on ships. It was written in prison. It was written in homes. It was written in palaces. It was written in all kinds of locations. But you know what the greatest thing about the word of God is? They all came up with the same theme. The theme of the redemption of Jesus Christ. From cover to cover over 1,600 years. And today people tell us, that the Bible is not all together. The Bible is, you know, there are some things that are old-fashioned. You know, it was written for that time. And they try to get you to not believe one of the greatest things that God gave you. The Old Testament scribes, when they would copy these scrolls from one to another, right? They didn't have photocopy, but it was even as good as a photocopy. They say when these scribes would take a book and they would, they would copy it, and then after they finish copying it, they would count the letters. That means, let's say one book has a thousand A's, the letter A. When they finished copying and they counted, and if that book had a thousand and one A's, they threw that away and copied again. That's how accurate they tell us the Bible has come up even from the point of what man did to keep it consistent. These are eternal principles. And look at what Jesus says. You, you, you don't believe anything else I said? Well, you can read what I said up. But look, listen to what Jesus said. Listen to Matthew 24, 35. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. How many can say Amen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. You know, no book has been more criticized, more judged, more ridiculed, more banned, more burned, more destroyed than this book. And it is still fresh and still relevant. Amen? As it was over 2,000 years ago. You see, God has establish certain physical laws. Even with physics and chemistry, there are some laws that don't change. They are facts. They are there. They don't change. And, uh, you know, like the law, if you, if, you, if you jump off a tall building, guess what? You're going to go down. Am I right? You don't believe it? Don't try it. <laughs> if you mix certain chemicals together and put it in your eyes, you will go blind. Hello? Are you with me? Anytime you ignore God's physical laws, 
For instance, if you're going 100 miles an hour, you know, and you're driving fast down the street like Nick does, and suddenly you hit a wall. You drive 100 miles an hour and you hit a wall, what will happen? You don't break the law. The law breaks you. Am I right? Hello? You know, I got I to teach this again. I haven't preached in a long time. In Sri Lanka, when the preacher says hello, the people say hi. So let's try it. Hello? Hi. Hello? Hi. Hello? Hi. Okay, we're on the same page now. Right? So it's like that. You, you don't break the law. The law breaks you. If you jump off a tall building, you know, if I jump off a tall building, I don't break the law of gravity. The law of gravity breaks me. Are you with me? These laws do not change because God's word does not change. In the same way, God has established some moral and spiritual laws in this universe. For instance, God set some boundaries, perimeters. He gave us a measure with the word of God. He gave us a measure about sexuality. He gave us a measure about how to live uh, free of sin. He gave us a measure how to live a holy life. He gave a measure in what he created, man and woman. And then he, he, he lined up everything within that measure. Now listen, your measure may be different to my measure. My measure is the word of God. Man's measures keep changing. Yeah. Right? And God has created this measure where spiritual and moral laws have been given to us. When we ignore these moral and spiritual laws, we don't break them. They break us. And we get hurt. You see, these are for my benefit. These are not a bunch of rules in your church. You know, you got to follow and blah, 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 blah. No, these are for my benefit. These are for your benefit. Amen? So you see, many of our society's ills, even take simple things like uh, sexually transmitted diseases, wouldn't be existing if we followed God's moral law. What is God's moral law? There shall be no sex outside of marriage. Right? And you say, oh, that's old-fashioned... I want to tell you, that's God's moral law. That's the creator telling us. And when you get out of that law, you get into a lot of messes. You know, leave alone sexually transmitted diseases for, for sex outside of marriage. What about all the heartaches? What about families that hurt forever? I've seen teen suicides because somebody, the parents, broke the law. You see? So, so, so we get all messed up in this that's why we need to go to the Word of God, the owner's manual. Nobody knows our lives like the owner, like the creator. You know, whether it's premarital sex, adultery, pornography, murder, lying, I want to tell you, sin, my friend, is sin. It is not VFC's code of ethics. It is God's Word that condemns sin. It is not the church and, oh, they are putting all this. No, this is what God has told us. And we follow that at People's Church in, in Sri Lanka, you know, we love the sinner. We love the sinner. We love those who don't have it all together. You know why we do that? Because even the pastor is a sinner, saved by grace. And so if we say, okay, we condemn all sinners, unfortunately, we won't have anybody to preach to. We love the sinner, but we don't condone the sin. Why? Because the word of God is our measure. Amen? Look at Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Oh, what did you read? That's old-fashioned. That's outdated. We live in a whole new world. Listen to me. God does not invent new rules for each new generation. The truth is eternal. It never changes. What was wrong a thousand years ago is wrong in 2024. Because God's word is eternal. Right? Don't, don't let believe people say it's nonsense. It's a bunch of rubbish. It doesn't matter. Why? Let's look at this again. Listen to Jesus' words. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. It abides forever. Amen. Amen. The third point. My final point. I love saying final point. Because, you know, three people just woke up. Everybody got a smile. Right? It's like, okay, let's finish this thing. 
right? Okay. What are the three things I said? God's love for you never changes. God's word never changes. And finally, God's purpose for you never changes. Never. Never changes. God's purpose for my life, for your life, never changes. Long before you were born, God planned you. God planned you. Even before your parents met each other, God had a plan. And that plan has never changed. God created you for a purpose, my friend. You were made for a reason. The reason you're alive today is because God has a plan for you. You know, you're saying, oh, no, I don't really have a purpose. Not like those people. Those people on stage, you know, they're more holier than I. You know, they have this. No, I want to tell you, if you're breathing and your heart is beating, God has a plan for you. God has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. And that will not change no matter what happens in life. Look at Psalm 3311. Psalm 3311. But the Lord's plans stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. Regardless of what happens in your life, regardless of all the wrong turns and mistakes you made, please, somebody listen to me. Regardless of the mistakes you made, regardless of the wrong turns you've taken in your life, the wrong decisions, whether you think it was in marriage or in this or in that, it doesn't matter. You're not condemned forever. God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. God created you. Even all those dumb, stupid decisions that you and I have made in the past. Listen to me. God has no plan B. Do you get that? God has no plan B for my life. He doesn't have a plan B for your life. Oh, but you're saying, but pastor, what, what about my divorce? So what about it? You got divorced, you got divorced. I'm not saying that's right, but it happened. You don't hold that over your life and then take, go to the grave doing nothing. We all make mistakes. It's just different. Jesus died on the cross. So my mistakes also can be forgiven. Some of you, because you had a mistake and, and it looked like it was condemned, you, you, you gave up everything. No. You're saying, well, but pastor, what about my abortion? No, what about it? If you had an abortion, it's not the best thing. Divorce is not a great thing, but you had it. Now don't die before God tells you to come home. You got to live. You have a purpose. And some of you who have gone through deep hurt and deep messes in life, think about it. God will say, I will turn, take all that and turn it to good because you can minister to people in a greater way than somebody else can. Nothing is wasted here because when God touches it, he makes all things good. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not saying some of these things are good. But if it happened, it happened. God's purpose. You, there is no plan B. Amen? There is no plan B. Look at Proverbs 19.21. You can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. Again? You can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. How many can say amen? Regardless of what is happening in our world today, don't be afraid. Why should I be afraid? Just trust in God. His word never fails. As I tell you, you know, God's word never changes. He has given you over 7,000 promises for you. He has still not, not come through with a promise. And he's never going to do that. Everybody around us is lying. They lie about God's word. They lie about what God has said. They try to put it in the past. I want to tell you, you can never put God in the past. God is there with you. God will see you through. God will never stop loving you. You can never stop God from loving you. Right? Even when you feel unlovable, God loves you. He will never stop loving you. God is always God knows and his word knows the right thing and the right thing for us to do. You know, today I just want you to come to the place of realizing that God never made a mistake when he made you. He made you the way you are. He took you through that path that you sometimes hate. 
He brought you through. You know why? Because there is only one of you. There was no you or anyone like you before you. There will be nobody like you after you. There is only one of you. And I always say this. You know, God doesn't anoint buildings and pulpits and microphones and TV cameras and screens and instruments. God only anoints men and women. And you are God's chosen man. You are God's chosen woman. And God has a plan for you. And you've got to realize in this ever-changing world of disappointments and, and sometimes crises and failures and diseases and we don't know what to do, God put you there. God put me there because we are God's hand extended. You are to be the salt of your community, the salt of the earth. You flavor everywhere you go. You are the light that shines in the darkness because God has a plan for you. You know, God wants to use you, my friend. Not, not just VFC, not the missions program or not the small groups. He wants to use you. You as an individual. He has a plan for you. But are you willing to be used of God? I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. And as you stand, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Given everything I've shared from God's word about who God is, about his love for you, his word never changes, and his, your, your purpose will never change. God will always honor his part. He'll always do his part. But will you today, where you are, say, Lord, I'm sorry for backing out. I'm sorry for not stepping out in faith. I'm sorry for not thinking that you made me for a purpose. I will do whatever you have for me. I will be what you want me to be. Would you raise your hands? And I want you to, before we pray for everybody, just pray a three-word prayer. Okay, raise your hands right up. Just pray a three-word prayer. It's a, it's a daring prayer. But I want to tell you, it'll give you the greatest joy you've ever had. It's three words. Let's say it together. Say it after me. Jesus, use me. Now say it. Jesus, use me. Say, Jesus, use me. Not somebody else today, Lord. I'm giving myself to you. Jesus, use me. Use me. Use me, Lord. Use me. Use me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, complete your work. Complete your work. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.